Thank you, Dirk, for such a lovely score. Just really a lot of thought put into it. <clears throat> Some very yeah, professional level scoring going into this. Uh, a lot of foresight, a lot of calculations. I think there are still a lot of things I could help you with. <clears throat> and, you know, to perhaps make your score even better. There are a few things that may not be working as well as you possibly, you know, you, as you perhaps perceive them. Maybe I can help you work out a few of those things. <clears throat> yeah, pardon my... Um, Clearing my throat. I'm just coming back from breakfast. So, let's jump straight into this. <laughs> um, just really enjoyable how sort of brash and and muscular and this whole thing is. Now, uh, you, one of the problems you're going to immediately run into here is that in this kind of fortissimo scoring, the the harp just has no chance that that it will not be heard over this <clears throat> all of this sound i mean the the heavy brass alone will be enough to blot out the harp if it weren't for all of the other elements so the harp is even if you were to do a huge roll here to try to to you know try to break up the um where the where the beat is falling across the strings it it still will not have much of a chance um now here this glissando is perfect and I appreciate the way that it is really crossing a lot of distance in the in the harp. Now, do octave glissandos really sound louder or fuller than just a straight glissando? Yes and no. I, I mean, yes, if you can really hear it for its own sake, and no in the sense of, like, everything being fortissimo anyways, you would probably get the same exact effect if you went did a glissando from this low B all the way up to this high E, or maybe even the E above that, right? If you just did one huge sweep across six octaves, um, then you, you probably would have get the same effect or, or just maybe even stronger because you'd be covering more strings more deliberately in a shorter amount of time. <clears throat> or in the same amount of time. Now, there is a further problem, and this is sort of leading into the evaluation criteria that I am going to go over in just a minute. Now, just a, a little bit of a um, preliminary thing to say about these these um, brev level orchestrations. It's 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 nearly the full the you know the entire piece. It's just like not not including e. So I will just make a few brief comments about the E section, and I'm also allowing the Brev level uh, contributors to to have their entire arrangement uh, shared here, the the mock-up and the screen for the screens for all for the entire three and a half minutes of music. <clears throat> so I'll give you just a few things at the end. A few comments, a little bit of thoughts and feedback and so on. <clears throat> so, just talking about the accompaniment style right in here, I don't feel that the harp is strong enough. It, it is just going to be invisible, especially with any kind of trombones and horns. Horns absorb the sound of the harp, and of course, uh, trombones just blow it out of the water. <clears throat> and then you've got all of these other things happening at the same time. So this, just a huge focus on the melody here could perhaps be put into, you know, that some, maybe more instruments could be involved in, in this more, this wonderful dancey accompaniment style, bringing that out a little bit more instead of so much, um, like long, uh, long tones, right? Um, uh, almost like pedal tones in each bar, just like, or just like a, just this harmony um, taking up space. So, um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that's just something to think about. The harp is not strong enough to perform the function, and you can hear in the mock-up, right, that the harp just really isn't, you know, it really isn't all that loud. You might, you might boost it a little bit in the mock-up, but then that's unnatural, isn't it, right? The, 
generally speaking, <clears throat> the sound sets like um, like um, note performer and so on are sort of balanced to what their dynamic would generally be in the orchestra. Sometimes it's a little off and sometimes not, but the harp is just not strong enough to support, right? And these these few little staccato notes are not enough to to replace what's missing, right? So maybe more pizzicato is needed, more uh, pizzicato doubled by more emphatic gestures in in middle winds or in brass, which there's a lot of brass not really doing anything all that special, or maybe holding down pitches that are sort of slowing things down. So. Um, yeah, so just watch out for that. Uh, sorry, slowing things down is the wrong is the wrong word. Uh, uh, capturing the momentum, right? The the it's sort of restricting the momentum of the passage, right? Like when you have a lot of when you have a very dancey kind of a section, but there are just as a lot of sort of straight harmony, you know, footballs as they would say. Uh, so now <clears throat> let's get to the evaluation criteria. So. Um, I'm, I'm sort of realizing that I'm covering a lot of the same issues uh, in a lot of scores. And uh, this uh, selection, um, the this FIA movement, is longer than the average piece that I have been assigning in these uh, evaluations, in these uh, challenges. So uh, if I don't rein it in a little bit, then... Uh, we're going to end up with two hour, like a two hour video on just one, one entry. And I don't think that most people will be willing to sit through that. Right. And especially to hear me repeat things a lot. So I may, um, I may breeze over a couple of things that I've covered a lot in other entries. And, uh, if you are just going to watch your own, uh, your own video, then I apologize, Dirk, you know, you just maybe watch a few of the other, few of the videos that came before this in the dotted brev category and that will cover some of the some of the things but I will mention things as I go along um, just for reference and suggestions and so on <clears throat> now let's talk about the uh, evaluation criteria so the first one being uh, pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano score that's not an issue of, of it becoming too repetitive or or relentless when we get to this section here. So that's taken care of. Now, the thematic material repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated exactly the same way throughout, right? So that is a little bit of a con concern. Like, the approach taken in each of these pairs of bars is more or less the same, right? There are a few little changes, one or two changes here and there, but they're not really significant. And so, uh, you know, you, you should think about that. Is there any way that you could possibly maybe hold back a little the first time and then magnify the second time? Or is there some way of, of maybe adding more to, like maybe more lower heavy brass here or maybe changing things around a little bit in, in the way things are are accompanied or, or underlined? Maybe you could maybe not be quite so expansive in the upper range at first and then add more later, right? So there's there are a bunch of different ways of dealing with this. Now, as to the scoring itself, <clears throat> you know, it's, it, it's all pretty good. Uh, the thing that you have to watch out for is whether or not uh, the clarinets really make any difference on these written C sharp sounding B, right? When you have so much weight in the trumpets. Could there possibly be like a refocusing of some of the wind harmony around these very emphatic Bs, right? Just they really are going to are just powerfully cut through everything. The other problem here is this F double sharp trill, right? F double sharp to G sharp. And it's a very cool idea. Uh, the the kind of the problem that I have here is we've got a single bassoon, right? And there is essentially no support from any other instrument really on that pitch. And there is so much weight from the horns and 
and so on, the lower strings and middle strings, that I just feel that this will just disappear. And once again, in the mock-up, you can't hear it. Not, not that the mock-up is always a de always determines whether or not something is audible, but I would say in this case, that you're, what your what your ears are telling you is true. You know, even though you're kind of holding back on your horns a little bit, you know, this um, this these F sharps here in your second and fourth horns only sounding up a third from the um, from this trill right in here, uh, F sharp, F double sharp to G sharp, <clears throat> up a third from that G sharp, um, it'll still be enough to just blot out the sound of the trill and the bassoons. Now, if this were being doubled in, if the, if it were Atu bassoons and it were being doubled in cellos, then I think you would have a chance, right? And then maybe this B could go to the trombones, but it still is a little dodgy. You know, it's a, it's a, it's not quite the clearest scoring. <clears throat> But otherwise, you know, I think that it works fine. Maybe the um, the upper the upper part of this motive right here could be doubled by maybe flutes or piccolos or sorry, sorry, flutes or oboes. I meant to say just to just to give make it more solid and not to have it so dominated by the trumpets on the second violin line. Okay, so now going to <laughs> This this second part, and then sort of the development going forwards. The melody soaring quite high. The accompaniment figures covering a wide range. So we already talked a little bit about the accompaniment figures, and once again, I'll just reiterate. I think I think that the nimbleness, uh, the danciness of the left hand in this particular section is essential, right? And you are, you're giving it to the harp, but the harp is just so easily overwhelmed, right? And some of those pitches we're seeing in the, um, in, or an interpretation of that idea in the second oboe and English horn, but it's just, you know, once again, it's not strong enough. The, I think that perhaps your violas and cellos could be covering that left hand, you know, what, what we're seeing here. And with with support from the winds and maybe even more support than you're giving it. Uh, maybe these long pitches don't need to be in there, right? Uh, maybe they're, they're sort of stifling the momentum of the music. So it's almost like a double problem, right? That you've set yourself, the, the problem that the harp is inaudible and that this isn't strong enough. So on the one hand, so we're curtailing the effectiveness of the danceable rhythm, and then on the other, we have kind of this lo this this sort of kind of uh, pad like harmony that also sort of restricts the momentum of the passage, right? So, so I would just say rethink that. Just 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 look into it to see if there's some way of making this more lively, right? Yeah, and I, I'm I. I I think it's cool, like repeating, repeating E and so on. And I mean, that's all really fun. And I like the doubling with the winds and the strings. Uh, that's all really effective. So, but I'm, I'm not sure that the, you know, E, 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 B is, um, is enough of a replacement in terms of that, you know, that very nimble left hand. I like the idea of the idea of the tambourine in here. That's very, very cool. All right. Now here we sort of have kind of what happened before. Same comments. Um, and then right the the whole problem of the melodic development getting very high is solved very nicely here you do not need <clears throat> the ottava mark at all the string players can read up there your your violinist can read fine um, if you were going to have measure after measure after measure way up in you know, in the top octave uh, of the of the piano C7 to C8, then maybe throwing in some ottava. And if, if it was all fingered, right, rather than play, being played as harmonics, if it was all fingered fairly fast and <clears throat> and so on, then I would say that would be the exception. But it isn't, right? Right here, it's just a, just a couple of notes. Now, you also may want to ask yourself whether or not this is just a little screechy, going all the way up to the D and the C and, and you know, all the way up to E here. <clears throat> It's it's not that it's not that it's unplayable, not at all, and and it's not even all that rare. You know, there there are plenty of places in the in the standard repertoire where 
<clears throat> where violinists go up to that high C and even higher. But it's just a question of how musical is it, you know? How, how beautiful is it? Uh, you know, not the most beautiful thing. So you'll find that in other entries, people have sort of dropped down. They've got, run all the way up to the A, and then they drop down the D and the C, and then come back up to A. And the same thing here, just like drop down past the A, and then come up doubling the, uh, the same pitches as the second violin, and just let the overtones of both of those instruments, of both of those groups of instruments, fill in the sound picture, doubling the piccolo going all the way up. Now right here, you might want to come in a little earlier with your piccolo. Like if the piccolo starts back here at this A sharp, then nobody's really going to hear it. But as it runs upwards, you will start to hear the cumulative, you know, the cumulative effect of that line going just in a straight line all the way up to E. Um, overall, as it thickens this and then the other notes or the other instruments drop down, right? The main thing is to avoid a parallel drop, right? Um, there is no reason why your clarinets couldn't run all the way up to a high F here. However, if they if the flutes drop at the same time as the clarinets, the ear will pick it up, right? So maybe stagger, if you really are going to drop down and stick with this F, then maybe just go a few notes further and then drop down maybe around this C or D. And then it'll all seem like this one imperceptible push all the way up to this. Now here we're getting to this next part. And, you know, <clears throat> the whole problems of the upper middle register feeling relentless if there's no textural contrast. Well, there is textural contrast, and that's fine. Uh, keep in mind that the horns here are really just going to be hugely biting. You've, got, you've already got that same pitch of B playing being played here by the trumpets so so the you know the sound of the e is going to be really penetrating right in the middle right um right where you, the same same pitch is here as the these violins so it's just a question of whether or not you need that much weight um uh, the the combined weight of of this higher first horn and the trumpet so the trumpet by itself is fine it's not going to necessarily outplay the other instruments I mean, yeah, it is going to outplay the other instruments, but it's not going to just just devour their timbre, right? But the combination of this and the horn may just really take out the middle range here, and make the you know the clarinets and the second violins at a big disadvantage, <clears throat> and also the oboes, right? So, so maybe rethink that high B. Maybe not. Maybe it's all right. Okay, and then this this little. You know, arcing downwards, subtracting elements of accompaniment as you go. That's all very, very smart. And now going into this sort of driving staccato section and transitioning smoothly to the next passage, I feel that you have covered that really, really well. <clears throat> We've got the, um, the strings working together. It's all looking great, you know, and then just the just the handoff of these winds, these wind groups towards each other, and then the little trill right in here from bass clarinet. That is awesome. Okay, so now turning to the next section, <clears throat> we can see that the that that previous uh, phrase really does lead into this it is it, with a nice transition right and now here this is kind of interesting so th i've had some comments i've made some comments recently in some evaluations for people uh, on the release you know the release schedule like if you if you're just watching these as i release them then it will be like over the past few days although for me it's all today because i started this morning and this is my fourth evaluation of the day so <clears throat> there were not not really questionable, but you know possibly possibly too soft, right? Was was or or easily buried uh, in the texture was the use of some uh, natural harmonics, right? Now now right here, like this really is a natural harmonic, and there's there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't just score this at pitch with the circle over it, right? And the player absolutely knows how to set that up. They will go for the strongest harmonic. The strongest harmonic is the open harmonic on the octave for the open string, right? 
it's just so easy and like that that's this right um now this is actually a little dubious right in order to like this is actually kind of impossible to get right you, you would have to um you would have to do like a fifth harmonic on the g string fingered a uh with a touch five harmonic and you could get this e but it's just really not not a thing you know what i mean i think you mean that you want this to be an open e string and so that so it's better i feel it's better to use the letter o right for open <clears throat> and you know in many other languages so maybe a letter maybe a letter o rather than like if you have these other uh harmonics these other like natural harmonics before it then to differentiate that with o for open string and you know the the players may just play it, it as an open string anyway okay <clears throat> so let's talk about the evaluation criteria though i really want to stay focused on this because i think i think that that is the way to go with these longer entries so the, the concerns that we've got for this screen are contrast of color and breadth of texture, right? So, you know, how, how, how big is the arrangement? How, uh, what kinds of colors are interacting with each other so that it isn't just the same thing all the way through, right? So you're like, for instance, here you are trading off between colors and then here you sort of read rethink i mean there's some of the same instruments but it's a different kind of texture right especially with trading off in the melody instrument which i think is very clever all right so so that is definitely you're ticking that box and then maintaining differentiated roles in closely spaced melodies and over overlapping accompaniment figures you're also doing that very very well then we have that additional concern of keeping high interjecting notes from sounding too glaringly repetitive, just really standing out, right? Here you have the horns and this this E right here, right? So you're, you're sort of making that chord, right? Uh, but un unfortunately, I feel that the horns will outplay the, the violins here, and you can actually hear that in the mock-up too, right? I think that it has to be all of one thing or all of another. So it would have to be like all horns here or all brass here or all strings here. But I think that you can't combine these instruments in this way. The horns are just too powerful as they go into as they start to go above the staff. They're just too powerful to create a blend, a, pro, a proper blend with the violins. Now, you could drop this down to, say, mezzo forte or even piano to try to combine this. But then then you just have the... Um, the timbres of the two instruments are just not not really coherent, or they're not they're not um, cohesive with each other. They're not pulling together, right? So you might want to rethink this. Maybe make this more about winds. Uh, maybe winds sort of playing along with the strings, and maybe them both taking on harmonic parts, All right? So, but I think that the other ways that you deal with those interjecting E's are really great and you sort of make it part of the the uh, thematic fabric right and that's really well done I really think that that is super okay so the <clears throat> the next thing is just to kind of look at the at the way that we have the sort of trade-off between the two elements you know first the just kind of restating the opening, uh, the opening theme, and at, at the same time, and I think that that's that's done pretty well. <clears throat> you know, good trade-off, good doubling. I think right here, I think that the cello should go all the way to the C sharp. Don't worry about it being tripled, right? Just walk like have this doubled and actually have the violas come in right on the e right so just keep the keep it thick all the way through and then right in here bah, 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 yeah, da, 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 da. i'd really like the trade off here and so it's it's a little strange i mean i don't know why you did why you wrote this like this and that like that right see your copyist is going to get back to you 
and say, look, I don't know how to prepare these parts. Like here you have two voices sharing, a, or you have two voices sharing a single line, and here you have one voice, and you didn't tell me a ah, two or what, right? And in general, you're a bit careless about telling us how many players on a voice and so on. So, you know, something to think about in the future, just take the time when you're doing your last bit of proofreading, you know, and, and like, write, like, uh, first player, like, like you know, number one period, right? To tell us one player or a ah, two for two players and so on. <clears throat> but generally speaking, it's a solid approach. And of course, the big star here are these, um, these octave harmonics, which are very strong. And they will work fine in this texture, just so long as the trumpet doesn't play too loudly, right? You might want to tame the brass right in here by scoring the mezzo forte. And then, you know, just having them work, like making sure that the, that the melodic notes are doubled uh, right here when, the, when there is a thicker texture. Okay, so now we're headed to this section in here. Uh, -da 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 and right here in my evaluation criteria, it says um, that there's a real concern about keeping the triplets from overwhelming the melodic line. Now that isn't a that isn't a concern if you have the melodic line trading off between different brass instruments. Of course, that's not going to be a problem. However, however, I think you should clearly mark the, the, the diminuendo in all parts, right? If you're going to go from forte to mezzo forte to eventually piano, right? We, we also need to sort of have that marked in here too, right? And I think that like, I think that the triplets are also part of that, aren't they? Right? I think that, that that you can swell all together in in all parts, right? Maybe not the tambourine. Okay, so trade off from uh, from first horn to trombone to muted horn, and you know, could this be possibly stopped, right? Maybe instead of muted and then muted trumpet. So you would get open, like then the difference between the horn and the trombone timbre going from conical to cylindrical to stopped to muted, right? I think that that would, that would be a nice progression. And the stopped sound is really, is, you know, in, in this kind of scoring is very much unlike, you know, if you have an exposed melodic solo, it is really unlike uh, the the sound of the muted of the muted horn but you know maybe you would like you prefer that muted sound to the uh, stopped sound yeah and I, I love the idea of the <clears throat> of the horn coming in here harmony and then becoming the becoming the melody that's such a cool idea I mean, you could have almost done that here, right? The, have the uh, trumpet come in here and uh, supply the uh, supply the harmony right in here and then go to the E. I mean, you could do that in every case, right? The trombone could come in here a little early instead of the <clears throat> instead of the second horn. Anyhow, um, I think I think what's missing here is is that these are really supposed to be accented, like, and you're, you're kind of trying to supply the accent just by doubling that first note, right? The oh, 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 no, da, 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 da. But, you know, you might not even need this staff right here and just add accents on, you know, at the beginning of each beam group. And you might get the same effect, right? Or not, I don't know. It's just something that you could possibly try. Or you could have pizzicato here this is unnecessary to give us a uh, uh, a down bow you might have pizzicato and an accent or tenuto right at the beginning of each of these beam groups and that would also be i think more effective and that's really kind of cool the way that you harmonize this that's all very that's all very playable
in on cello. So now moving on to C. So right here, um, I have in my notes uh, th that my concern here was a convincing Alargondo expansion, right? So I don't feel that this really expanded enough, right? I, I don't think that mezzo forte was strong enough. Now, I, 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 I respect the fact that you want the harp to, uh, to not get buried, right, in this case. But what if there was like it like in and here you've got the the thirty second notes and then the roll so that's it's sort of like the harpist is kind of thinking like well which one right it's it's almost like the same thing if you are rolling into the beat it's almost the same timing right it just will end up making this roll very very abrupt uh, but I think that you could have easily you could have easily expanded to forte. Right, and then pulled back immediately to uh, to a softer dynamic. Now here, I feel that like this isn't balanced, right? Mezzo forte going to this right here, forte solo, forte note, right, in in all the parts, and then this is mezzo forte, and then the harp is piano, and then the string parts are piano, right? So. What's the result here? Barely hear the harp. The strings are pretty subdued. And then the clarinet's really loud. And the oboe is really loud, right? So what if everybody was piano? And the harp stayed mezzo forte, right? Just try that in your mock-up. What if you went brium and then like forte piano here, brought everything down? And then here, instead of just, you know, saying, hey, I want this to be very expressive, show us what that means. What does it mean for this to be expressive? Well, could it mean, so just following the inflection of my singing right now, imagine that those were hairpins. Da, 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 da. Crescendo. Da, 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 da. Diminuendo. Da. Crescendo again, da, 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 and a little mixed in here. Da, 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 um, and you might even have somebody, like if you have an oboist from Spain, and they'll, then they'll think, aha, you know, I know exactly, like they didn't give me any dynamic marks, but you know, I, I've been, you know, I've grown up on this music. I'm going to just put in what I like, right? And they might actually improve on what you had imagined, but whatever that is, maybe you shouldn't just be giving everybody else the choice by not marking nuances in an extended solo. Same thing here, right? It's almost like you're lacking punctuation or you know capital letters or commas, right? We need to really put in all of the information into this this expression, right? <clears throat> but I would say, you know, aside from that, careful treatment of the melodic voice to make it feel authentic to the composer's style. So you could do that by adding the nuances, but the choice. I think of oboe is fine right in there. I think that works great. Uh, so just with a balanced, uh, with this balanced accompaniment and with the harp standing out rather than in the background, then I think that it's it's really nice. However, I do have an additional criterion to think about. If a harp to play a role, ensure that it doesn't dominate the picture or sound too much the same, right? So here you don't really need these um, this, these slurs right in here. It'll just, you know, you just put one big slur over the entire thing if you wanted to. Okay, so that keys into the other concern, which is keeping the accompaniment pattern from being too, from becoming too regular and therefore predictable, right? So what ways can you make this, uh, you know, just not just feel like a, like, kind of a drone from from the harp just a or just a kind of motoristic energy that that is just the same all the time right 
And Faya is already giving you some of these extra little notes that are in the piano part to keep the piano part from just, you know, um, from just becoming too predictable as well. So like maybe there like when I for my harp part I like I had it changing octaves and I had kind of a bass line tracking from below and moving around in octaves as well to just just to keep the the um the listener from becoming too settled right but we want them to be what well, we want it to be suspenseful we don't we don't want it to be ambient here right we don't want it to become like ambient music with a little solo over the top and then right in here right there's that there's, you know, how the, you know, how the piano part ends, you know, has that, right? So we, I, I feel that that's, you know, you could bring that out more. Maybe the, um, maybe the accompaniment can come in a little earlier on higher strings and just really bring out that sense of energy, you know, leading forward and then pushing into this with like with crescendo marks, right? Piano, what is going on? Like we can't just let the, we can't just let the registers of the instrument serve as as the crescendo. We have to write it in, right? And then here, mezzo forte. You know, once again, I'm just a little unclear on what what are the what's the dynamic level of everything, right? The harp should be the clearest to hear, you know, and the melody will be you know there'll be no problem with hearing the melody above, and then you know maybe the all the other elements could be piano. Yeah, but I really love this dumb right in here with a little touch of horn. That's very, very cool. But, you know, could, the, could this be all staccato and, you know, um, maybe second bassoon could be going uh, staccato. You know what I mean? It, like, could we just have that energy in there, right? Because, like, he's just saying, I don't care how much you are getting dreamy about that. This is a dance you know, damn it, <laughs> right? It's just, you know, it just brings us, it freshens us up. You know, it's the cold air in the face of the sweating dancer. So here we're getting into territory where uh, managing the sense of restraint leading to a burst of energy, right? So, so this is where I feel that like trading off melody instruments works really, really nicely, you know. And then maybe, maybe oboe answering... Da, 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 as we slow down and what about what about clarinet right in here or or english horn and then everybody just reeling back and just right i just feel it needs to be way more powerful in here i mean you're still in piano down here in these other instruments right so like we're coming in here we need like yes we need it to be placid and then as things start to pick up, poco animato, I think that the accompaniment needs to get fuller. And then when you come in here, you just have more energy, right? It just energy across all parts. And then you can pull back again. Dun, 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 dun. This is all really nicely done in here, by the way. I like this, except the harp just really doesn't have much of a chance. This is where pizzicato is going to be your friend, right? And just do some of these things that you want to do, the sort of the plucking feeling. Uh, doubling the uh, bassoon and this is so cool English horn and this is all really really nice in here and I really love these downward glissandos these are going to come through beautifully right just don't have the cymbal roll be too loud all right so I would just say like the the dynamics in here need to be worked out a little bit more right but the uh, this sort of last concern um of the evaluation criteria, which is like conveying a sense of drama and soloing of melody. It's really well done. Pulling back to lead into the next section, that's also done really, really nicely, right? And then we're ready to start on the agitato. And you know, right? And this is, yeah, you just really are giving us some playable stuff. Just watch out on those bass drum. You know, bass drum can just take over an entire uh, an entire timbre or entire texture, you know, just before you realize it. So just make sure that like it's the crescendos aren't too big. And yeah, but yeah, but all scored nicely. You know, bass clarinet and contrabassoon working together in octaves. What more could you want, right? It's it's such a great combination. Along with double bass, doubling the contras and 
the uh, cellos and violas working in octaves as low as they can go. It's so awesome. You know, and they're they're going to be playing on their C strings for most of it. And that just leads us to the big tutti, right? So our continuing concern about the low bass broken octaves, uh, I would say, like, why couldn't the bass clarinet and contrabassoon continue helping a little bit, right? Until we got to here. I just I just feel like the weight here gets a little, you know, compared compared in strength to all the other things that the low the low winds and the the horns and trumpet right um the balance is a little bit off if we're taking away the doubling from the lower strings now you could you could rebalance it by having the winds sorry by having the brass down a one dynamic degree right all throughout right the forte on just forte when you get to here to everybody else's fortissimo and then this should be a crescendo right isn't it triple f in the in the piano score and then you could go to to double f here in the uh, in the brass and then just pull back immediately for your uh for this section in here which by the way i'll have a lot to talk about we'll get there in a minute okay so so I would just say, just adding some balance here uh, will make this a, will make it just a little bit more dreamy sounding, and and uh, you know, just kind of follow the the kind of hallucinatory feeling of the of the build up to this massive uh, tutti right in here. So so far as it is, it's fairly well scored, right? I think that it's it's working pretty well. I would almost prefer that this would be in the oboes. Because, you know, we've got a bit of weight in the horns and, and so on. But, I mean, it'll still work in the flutes if it's ah to. But it just, I just feel like it would be stronger on oboe and then... Or you could have ah to flutes and one oboe. And then go to this right in here. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, nicely scored. No problems. Yeah, and, and just getting bigger. All right. And this is very, very interesting. Uh, so, and, and just having the um, the strings just, just hammer away at uh, this measured tremolo here. I, th I think that's that's fantastic. That's a really, really great way to handle it. And just the, just the harmony from the uh, trombones and horns. Yeah, that's just very nicely done. Yeah, you know, two T's are not all that hard to score if the source material is strong. Now, uh, one thing that I will say, and that is like the 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 viola here, be really easily overwhelmed by a lot of the things that are happening in the winds and brass, right? So it's the kind of place where, like, the more that you unify the strings, like maybe in playing octaves or triple octaves with each other, then the then the like the the stronger the wind the excuse me, the stronger the string sound can be. The more you unify the strings, the stronger the string sound can be. And then you know, same thing here. Like this will just disappear against a lot of what's going on in other instruments. So it'd be better da -da 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 right and tremolo, you're making it really clear that you don't intend for this to be measured tremolo. That's great. It's good it's a good thing to add there. Yeah, just, yeah, I, I feel it's about the only thing that I feel might be a bit over the top is just bass drum and cymbals crash, 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 crash over and over and over and over and over again. What if we just went crash, da, 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 ba, da, ba, da, ba, crash, da, 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 crash, 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 boom, boom, crash, da, 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 crash, boom, boom, crash, and then crash, crash, crash. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe, maybe make it progressive instead of continuous. Maybe that would work better. I don't know. Okay, so <clears throat> now, continuing on, um, we have a big concern here, a convincing transition to the agitato, the rotating patterns. Okay, so the problem here is that the harp 
is is such a delicate instrument, right? That if you want this to come off, everybody has to come down to like piano, right? So all of this has to be piano if you want the harp to work here. Uh, <clears throat> you could possibly double what's going on here in the harp, say in clarinet. And there's also the problem of this chord, pow. You may notice in my orchestration lesson of my own orchestration of this, uh, that I have a bit of a comma or a bit of a pausa right here uh, so that the, uh, so that, you know, between the downbeat and then the one and or like whatever happens next, there is just a bit of a gap so that the hall can clear, right? Because right here, the concert hall has this massive reverberation uh, across it. The, the power of this chord, especially hitting... Um, this tu this tuba note, this lower brass here, just uh, you know the the power of that will just make this big cushioning. It's, and also bass drum, right, right, playing fortissimo, will have the shock wave, right? And you need a little bit, like a split second, for it to die down before you go on. So, so to to interpret exactly as played, the ear of the listener in the concert hall will not really pick it up until about right here, maybe around the second beat, the third beat, they'll start to understand what's going on. So if you just leave a little bit of a pause, then you can just start right on the, you know, and make it really, like, um, make it really effective, right? So you could completely leave out the harp and then just start right here on one end. And then I would say if the harp is an important part of the sound picture here. You have got to rethink how everything is working because it just is not powerful enough. Now, this is a perfect place for xylophone, right? Put xylophone in here. You do not have to bring down the volume of anything and you still have that kind of sound, right? So I would say throw in xylophone here if you really need, like if that is your idea of how to interpret the rotating patterns, then the instrument for you is xylophone here and not harp. Right, the harp, it's just, it cannot compete. And I and I get the feeling, just by looking at the way this is all scored, it's very nicely scored, um, that bringing down the volume is not going to make it sound better. Right, It might actually make things worse. So change instruments, change what this is. Because otherwise, what you're going to hear is pow, uh, uh, uh. You know, it just really feels like a continuation of this, and so instead of the rotating patterns, making it feel new, right? But you know, this is all fun. The um, staccatissimo, the measured tremolo, and the strings. I think that all works great. But I think this should be mezzo forte. All right, and that takes us to here. Same same comments as before. A xylophone is your instrument here, not harp, unless you really intend to bring everything down very very softly. And in a in a uh, texture like this, really the trombone has got to be mezzo forte, or else it's going to stand out like a foghorn. You know what I mean? It, especially with the contrabassoon below it. The contrabassoon can can be forte. That's fine. But the trombone is just too. Uh, the the projection is just too big. All right, and I don't know, I don't think you need the lead in note. I don't think you need A, B, da, 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 da. I don't think you need that in there. I think you can just start right on the downbeat. With everything coming to an end. And that is the, that, that is the final concern here, the convincing transition from fragmentation to the lyrical part E. Now, as I promised, I'm just going to have a few comments uh, nothing in huge detail. Just to say, you know, once again, uh, you know, with expression, right? So, where is that expression? You have to show us. Yeah, poco a poco decrescendo. Who cares? And then a little softer. And a little softer than that. Right, so just really write in some nuances for the poor players. Right, there is a um, you know 
Maintaining interest in the rotating patterns is also a concern. Like how, how long can you keep going with these patterns before people just get tired of the harp, right? Um, are, are there ways of trading off or adding texture from other instruments that come and go? And, you know, that those are additional concerns, right? And then uh, right in here, I, I really love the idea of the um, of these octave harmonics. Now, once again, you do you do not need to score octave harmonics like this. Just just score the intended pitch with a circle over it, and everybody knows that's an octave harmonic. Say here on the E string or here on the A string, right? Now this is more like it, like. Like, uh, I prefer this than just writing the diamond note head and not having the A below it, right? So C sharp, the A below it, and then you get that high A. So I think that's beautiful. We have the sense of iciness and then the transition to intimacy with English horn. What could be more intimate than that? ba da -um. ba, -ba -da -um. Clarinet, yeah, it's just wonderful, just wonderfully scored here at the end. So, so really nice, Dirk. I I really enjoyed this. I'm so happy that you sent me this big full arrangement with such clever scoring. And and I hope that, you know, if there's anything, um, anything in what I'm saying, you know, if it's useful to you, and you know, you can use it, um, that would really be fantastic. And you know, we're we're starting to see here. As we're getting towards the, um, the this very last stage, the brev and then dotted brev, and longa level uh, contributions, people have really taken a lot of time and put a lot of effort into getting things that are into scoring things that are pretty much ready to go to the stands, right? As much as possible. So. I think, you know, it, it just among the many, many entries here towards the end of this orchestration challenge, I think you should try to get it performed. Wouldn't it be great if there were dozens of <laughs> dozens of performances of Andalusa from people who had participated in this challenge all over the world? If this became something, it's like, wow, did you um, hear the Schneiderheinze uh, interpretation of this? It's like, oh yeah, you know, that was pretty good. And you know, I, I like the Rodriguez uh, interpretation just as much, you know, that was with that other orchestra in Barcelona. And, you know, like, so, I mean, I, maybe I'm getting stars in my eyes here, but you guys are giving me such great scores and it's giving me this great feeling. So um, that's the perfect time for me to tell you that I really appreciate your support, uh, helping this channel keep going, helping me to include all of the people everywhere who want to do this, whether they're Patreon supporters or whether they are uh, website subscribers um, who are doing this, you know, for free. I, I really appreciate it all. I, I can't thank you enough. Um, your support really means a lot. And, and I, you know, doubly so because we composers have the hardest job in the world, really. You know, we being a musician is possibly the hardest profession, and being a composer on top of that is even harder. So, the fact that you guys can support this this channel and help thousands of other composers out there get better with their orchestration, it just you know it means a lot to me in just in the gesture of where we are, and it gives me a lot of hope for the future for this craft of orchestration that we all love. So. So thank you for that, Dirk. Thanks all of the to all of our Patreon subscribers and all of the website subscribers out there and everybody just watching this, leaving a comment and a like and a view. That's all hugely appreciated. It helps the channel grow and it helps thousands of people get stronger out there with their orchestration. And you know what? Um, I think I'm going to do another evaluation today. I'm just I'm on a roll. I just just really feeling it today. So so thanks so much for putting me in such a great mood with this great score, and I'll see everybody soon.